What do you picture in your mind when you hear the word ordain? Or think about someone being ordained? If you're from a Mormon or a Catholic background, it probably looks something like this. But is that really an accurate representation, scripturally speaking? Let's get into it. Welcome to Teacher in Zion Podcast. If you were raised in one of the many versions of Mormonanity, like I was, you were likely taught the precept of a restored priesthood, which most don't know wasn't actually introduced until 1834. The reason why we didn't know this is that the church's official history was later rewritten from the original count that was captured by John Whitmer. Uh, He was the first church historian. And according to our traditions, individuals receive authority to minister in a specific office when they are ordained by the laying on of hands by someone having the same or higher level authority as what they confer. I propose that we examine this premise uh, scripturally. We are told in the Bible, in the Book of Mormon, that God establishes his word in the mouth of several witnesses and, and even then sends even more witnesses after that. And all of the revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants that establish this form of priesthood that is familiar to Mormonism came from a single witness. That's problematic. And while a single witness doesn't in itself necessarily make it untrue, it does mean that God has not yet established or affirmed it as being from him, according to the method and pattern that he established. Additionally, the prophets are subject unto the prophets, and meaning that any new revelation that comes along should be in harmony with what has been given previously. The requirement for something to be true is more than just having additional witnesses, of course. Multiple witnesses can be misled or even lie. For something to be truly from God, it must also be in harmony with our foundational scriptures, which, to my understanding, are the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Let's see if we can find any evidence of authority bestowed in this way in the Bible, or especially the Book of Mormon. After all, we are told that within the pages of the Book of Mormon are all things written concerning my church, my gospel, and my rock. And again, the elders, priests, and teachers of this church shall teach the principles of my gospel, which are in the Bible and in the Book of Mormon, in which is the fullness of the gospel. And the things which are written in the Book of Mormon should be kept for the instruction of my people who should possess this land unto the confounding of false doctrines and laying down of contentions and establishing peace among the fruit of thy loins. So let's begin with Jesus calling his disciples, both in the kingdom of Judea before he went to the cross and in the new world after his resurrection. Can we find any passage where Jesus laid hands on his disciples in order to ordain them or grant authority to them? In my reading and searches that I've done in the scriptures, as well as asking other people 
this in case I missed something, I could not find it recorded anywhere that Jesus laid hands on either the twelve at Jerusalem or the twelve in the new world in order to ordain them to a specific office. He simply called them and asked them to follow him. Now, Jesus specifically calls out Nephi. He calls him forward out of the crowd and he makes him one of his disciples verbally. But no ordination is recorded. At one point, we do find in 3rd Nephi where Jesus tells the Nephites that later on, one would be ordained among them to break bread and bless it. And when the multitudes had eaten and were filled, he said unto the disciples, Behold, there shall one be ordained among you, and to him will I give power that he shall break bread and bless it. But does this mean that he laid hands on them to transfer this authority to do that particular task? And if so, was this a separate ordination from any other unrecorded ordination simply to a specific office? And why does Jesus say there will be one appointed to do this? That's curious to me. According to the version of priesthood offices found in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, anyone who is a priest or an elder or 70 or apostle or high priest uh, can serve communion. So this idea seems to be contrary to what Jesus is saying here in 3rd Nephi. He was going to appoint one, possibly out of the 12 disciples he had chosen, but one of them would be ordained to break bread and bless it. While we never read where Jesus laid his hands on anyone to ordain them, we do see the word ordain uh, used not only in the Bible, uh, but in the Book of Mormon. Therefore, we can examine the Hebrew and the Greek meaning of this word to get a better understanding. What I learned in doing this is that the word ordain in Hebrew means to appoint, uh, designate, or to simply authorize someone to do something. Similarly, in the Greek, it means to appoint or to consecrate. Let's keep that last word consecrate in mind as we'll come back to it. Based on these definitions, to ordain someone is simply appoint them or set them aside for a particular task. It isn't necessarily tied to laying on hands. A king or ruler, for example, can appoint someone to a position either by way of letter or just issuing a verbal command. It's sufficient, right? Based on the Greek and the Hebrew definitions, let's try to substitute the word ordain because I fear that we may have some connotations with it based on our tradition. And I just want us to look at it a whole new perspective. So looking at the Greek and Hebrew definitions, let's substitute ordain with the word appoint. And let's start with this verse in third Nephi to see how it would read. Behold, there shall be one appointed among you, and to him will I give power that he shall break bread and bless it. When people who are raised with a Mormon background read the word ordain, they immediately think of laying on hands, but that isn't necessarily the case. Let's look at another verse in the Book of Mormon that talks about someone being ordained. First Nephi. But the things which thou shalt see hereafter, thou shalt not write. For the Lord God hath ordained the apostle of the Lamb of God, that he should write them. Nephi had seen a vision of things to come, but he was commanded not to write them. And that was because John the Beloved would write them in the book of Revelation in the Bible. And this passage tells us in that John was ordained to write the vision. Does that mean that Jesus had to lay hands on John in order to grant him authority to write this particular vision? Or does it simply imply that John was 
appointed by God to write the vision. I think logic would conclude that he was simply appointed. And if someone is appointed by a king to perform a task, is that not sufficient authority to perform it? There is little doubt that when individuals are called to serve in an office of ministry, uh, wherever the church is organized, uh, we generally see men lay hands on them in a what I would call a ceremony of ordination. However, based on what I can see from the scriptures, it is my belief that in the early church, this was done not to confer authority, but simply to set aside or consecrate that person, essentially blessing them to perform their duty among a particular group of people. And this would be in harmony with what the Greek and Hebrew definitions of the word ordain is. When I was praying about this, the following illustration came to my mind. When an elder takes a bottle of olive oil, for example, uh, that he's purchased from the market, and he pours some of it out into a smaller vial, you know, something he could put in his pocket, which he might pray over then for the purposes of anointing. He is setting aside or consecrating that vial of oil. However, the properties of the oil do not change as a result. No power is conferred upon it. The oil doesn't suddenly carry supernatural properties. It remains olive oil. However, that oil has now been set aside for a very special purpose. I believe it is the same with ordination of an individual. When we lay hands on someone to ordain them, it is really an outward witness to the church of something that has previously been hidden to them. And that is that, for example, when a pastor receives by way of the spirit that someone is called to minister in a specific capacity, something that God knows that was previously hidden has now been made known to the rest of the church. A friend and elder teacher once testified of the spirit revealing to him that when God calls you to a specific ministry, for example, a teacher, he doesn't take out a magic wand and change you into a teacher as if you were not a teacher before, but now suddenly you are. Rather, he said, it is like God is holding up a mirror for you to look into, uh, helping to see who you are, who he made you to be. And looking into the mirror, God is saying, this is what I call a teacher. Someone called to be a teacher is a teacher because in the beginning, even before they were born, God had created them to be one. I believe the idea that men actually confer authority to be an erroneous concept that was introduced in 1834. As I have shared in four other videos on this topic, I believe this version of priesthood authority doesn't have any real backing, scripturally speaking. What we can know for certain is that true authority comes directly from God without intervention on the part of other men. When an ordination takes place among a body of people, None of those people participating in it have any authority to make anyone something. They can merely bear witness and stand in agreement with what God has chosen to do here. When we ordain someone to the office of elder, we are consecrating that person, even like that vial of olive oil. We're setting them aside for a specific purpose. The act of ordination serves kind of as an outward witness of the truth that we have received by way of the Spirit, that God has called this individual to serve the body as an elder, for example. By laying hands on that individual, we are not only blessing them for the task for which they have been asked to perform, but we are agreeing with God in regard to that individual's purpose thereby causing it to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Therefore, I believe ordination is basically an outward witness on earth 
of that which is already true in the eyes of God, even as water baptism is an outward witness of something that is already true. And that is that this person has made a covenant with God because baptism is not the covenant. It is a witness of the covenant. People are supposed to make a covenant with God through Christ, and then they are to bear witness to the church of that covenant by entering into the waters of baptism. Getting baptized alone is not making a covenant. It's just getting wet. I also believe that the scriptures bear out that unlike water baptism, laying hands on someone to ordain them is completely unnecessary wherever the church is in apostasy, disorganized, scattered, or in the wilderness. In fine, any time there is no one to lay hands on the individual, or no church really to bear witness of it, there's simply no need for it. Neither is there a need for an angel to come and confer that authority, because authority does not come from the act of laying on hands. We see this throughout the scriptures, with the likes of Alma, Moses, Abraham. Moses saw a burning bush. He heard the voice of the Lord. He answered the call and did as God commanded. Nothing more was needed. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Moreover, God can do as he pleases. This is a truth uh, we must embrace, or we'll be found fighting against God. The Apostle Paul was appointed by Christ to be an apostle, even though there was an organized church at Jerusalem. God saw fit to appoint him, which was all the authority Paul ever needed. His calling was not processed by the church. It was not voted on. Neither did any man ever lay hands on him to confer this authority. The only thing the church at Jerusalem needed to do was come to grips with whether or not they would accept the truth. That Paul was indeed a chosen apostle of the Lord, chosen outside of the bounds of their authority or any decision on their part. Men or angels may lay hands on someone and bless them, but authority does not come by way of men or angels, but by the gift and the calling of God alone. Likewise, we see that many prophets were raised up by the Spirit of God outside of the camp of Israel, without any official recognition or ordination by that nation, king, or its official priesthood. Lehi was appointed by God. He had visions and dreams, and he obeyed the voice of the Spirit. And by this means, he had authority to preach and cry repentance. The same can be said for his son Nephi. And nowhere do we read that men or angels laid hands upon either one. John the Baptist was likewise appointed by God to perform his ministry, and he was raised up in the wilderness to do so. Although there is a revelation printed in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants making the claim that John was ordained by an angel when he was eight days old, this is not supported in either the Bible or the Book of Mormon. I believe this idea was put forth and added to the narrative of the church organization in an attempt to support the premise of an exclusive priesthood authority which must be conferred by a man. And that man must then trace their authority back to Joseph Smith. And hence, the notion of the one true institutional church was born, to the exclusion of anyone who hadn't joined it. But John the Baptist had no need for an angel to come down in order to confer upon him authority to perform the task that God himself had already appointed him to do before he was even born. Even as God told the prophet Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah 1.5 God is the same 
yesterday, today, and forever. One of the earliest memories I have of hearing the voice of the Spirit after I made a covenant with the Lord and turned my life over to Him was while I was reading the passage in the Bible where the elders and the chief priests asked Jesus, By what authority are you doing these things? And the still small voice of the Spirit spoke to me as I finished reading that passage and said, I liken the restoration people as unto the Jews of old. As I understood it, God was showing me that just like the Jews I was reading about, the restoration people were all about questioning the authority of others, erroneously believing they are the only ones with authority. I was later shown that in the last days, those who hold to this absurd notion will have their authority stripped from them. The signs of the believers will cease from among them, and then they will be confronted with the powers of heaven being exercised by those whom they imagine could not possibly hold such authority. When we look at Abraham, or Moses, or Alma, or Lehi, or John the Baptist, or the Apostle Paul, we see no outward ordination being performed for them by the laying on of hands. Instead, God simply called and they answered. God spoke and they went forth and obeyed his command. And how can this be? For carried within a commandment from God or the ministry that he calls you to is the authority to do it. It's as simple as that. This topic is also very similar to any study you might do on how believers are to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the scriptures, one will find as many examples of people receiving the Holy Spirit without the laying on of hands as they do of those who receive it this way. With the household of Cornelius, not only did they receive the Holy Spirit without the laying on of hands, but they received it even before they got baptized in water. So to summarize, God does what he will in whatever manner he determines to do it, with or without our permission, and according to his own counsel. And so, whenever we try to make hard, fast rules about things like this, that God himself did not establish and that the scriptures themselves do not bear out, we run the risk of embracing the religious spirit and will eventually be found fighting against God. This is precisely what the religious leaders in the New Testament did that caused them to resist and reject the ministry of John the Baptist and the ministry of Jesus as well as his disciples. I believe it is essential that we recognize what the scriptures actually say and not how we've been taught to interpret them. We need to know what it actually says in the scriptures and what it does not say and be led in all things by the Spirit of God. Amen. And if I have not completely offended you yet, I hope you will join us next time. God bless.